Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from the Oncology Network. Welcome to the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Our host, Professor Craig Underhill, has got a great interview on Onco Burnout. Dr. Kate Clark talks us through breast cancer highlights from 2023. And Professor Christopher Jackson gets stuck into prophylactic radiation therapy for high-risk asymptomatic bone metastases. We also have a fascinating selection of quick bites with the usual high-level analysis and entertaining banter. Regular listeners will be familiar with our format. The hosts present main papers or interviews with guests alongside quick bite papers. Please see the show notes on oncologynetwork.com.au for papers, links and the full bios. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Journal Club podcast. G'day, Kia Ora, Kia Ora. It's a great pleasure to have back on the podcast Dr. Kate Clark from Wellington, Windy Wellington, and Professor Chris Jackson from Dunedin in New Zealand. Welcome to you both. How are you, Kate? It's actually sunny Wellington today, so you can't beat Wellington on a good day. And Chris, how are you going down there in Dunedin? Well, it's Sunedin, as we like to call it here. Dunedin has one excellent week of weather every year, and that's the week where the university students return to lull them all into a false sense of security before they get smashed with the Antarctic breezes, which make them freeze and immediately go out and raid all the op shops for secondhand clothing and coats. Um, so it's students arriving this week, and it's full on. Good on you. Well, thanks for giving up the time to come on the podcast. We've had some nice feedback from some listeners who are pleased that OJC Podcast is back. So that's been really great and encouraging. So we'll get right into it. Each of us, I think, is going to present what we call a long paper and then a quick bite or two each after that. So I had the great pleasure to talk to two inspiring young medical oncologists, Dr. Udit Nindra and Dr. Jenny Liu. We discussed a really interesting paper, really about a program that they designed. We'll have a listen to that and then um, we'll be back again. All right, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome not one but two guests onto the podcast for this very interesting paper we're going to discuss entitled Evaluating Systemic Burnout in Medical Oncology Through a National Oncology Mentorship Program, published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology Practice in December 2023. So I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. Uh, Firstly, hello, Jenny. Hi, Craig. And hi, Rachel. Thank you very much for having Udit and myself here today. So my name's Dr. Jenny Liu. I'm a medical oncologist at St. Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst. And in my day-to-day job, I treat patients with advanced cancers on early phase clinical trials as a translational lead. And I also treat head and neck and non-melanoma skin cancers. But in my spare time, I have a lot of passion on translational research, but also well-being and burnout. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for coming on the program. Jenny and I do a little bit of work together through the New South Wales Early Clinical Trials Alliance. It's how we met. And Jenny emailed me with this paper and suggested we discuss it. So thank you. We really value you people doing that, identifying some interesting papers. And Udi, would you like to um, introduce yourself as well? Hi, Craig. Hi, Rachel. I'm Udit. I'm one of the medical oncologists in the Illawarra Shoalhaven region and also a PhD candidate through the Liverpool Hospital Network. I am also the chair of the New South Wales Medical Oncology Advanced Trainees Committee, where we initially launched a pilot state-based program for mentorship and burnout and done a lot of work with Jenny on burnout and mentorship, and it's great to be here. Tell us about how this program came about. Sure. Yes. So this program came out of the New South Wales Oncology Advanced Trainees Committee, though about three years ago, I took over as chair of this and heat of the COVID pandemic, we were running a lot of career development and education sessions for our trainees, but then recognizing there wasn't much being done in this space to support the well-being of our colleagues. And we could see on the ground, there was a lot of staff turnover, a lot of burnout. I trained at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, where the basic physician trainees had a very good mentorship program and thought that maybe we could adapt some of the models there 
into oncology. So with Udit and others in the committee, we started with a New South Wales pilot. This was back in 2022. And that pilot involved 20 mentees or trainees and mentors who were consultants who volunteered to pair up on a virtual program. We didn't run this formally through ethics or do a formal study per se, but the feedback at the end of the program was that almost all pairs really benefited from the program. And prior to joining, about 83% of trainees didn't have a formal mentor. So it was really well received. And with the interest from the New South Wales pilot last year, we ran an inaugural national mentorship program, the baseline survey results of which has just been published in the JCO Oncology. Fantastic. Uta, could you tell us then about this particular study of how it was conducted and the findings? Sure. So we launched the National Oncology Mentorship Program in January of this year. And initially, when we launched the program, we set out the recruitment target to be 50 pairs of participants, so 100 participants overall. We allowed the mentees to be up to junior consultants. It could be any trainee that could um, volunteer, but also consultants that had just recently got their letters or recently become consultants could also apply to be in a mentee position as well. For the mentors, they had to have at least five post-fellowship years of experience. That was the minimum mandate from the mentors group. And we ended up recruiting 56 pairs across the country and they were spaced across all states. And that was uh, quite a pleasing result initially. When we initially did the recruitment, mainly this was through social media, snowballing techniques, and MOGA really helped us with sending across emails to recruit a lot from their database, as well as through social media and Twitter and other avenues that we used to advocate for the program. Once we had recruited, the first goal was to try to match the participants together. And we had a baseline survey for, that was individualized for the mentee group and for the mentor group to try to establish what characteristics they had and what they preferred in their mentee or mentor to try to best align them. One of the key goals was to try to make the matching state-based, but not within the same training network, which in certain states was a little bit easier than others, especially the bigger states like New South Wales and Victoria, where there are more training networks. It was easier to do that. But we managed to do that across all the networks after the initial period of matching. And this was really helpful with the other state advanced trainee committee members also volunteering their time to help with that matching process. Following the match, Jenny, myself, and Rhiannon Mello, who was the last medical oncology national training rep, ran a virtual orientation session for both the mentors and the mentees about the goals of the program and what we expected as part of their participation in the mentorship program. As part of the initial surveys that we did, we also did the burnout survey, which is what the results presented in the JCO Oncology Practice paper show. This burnout survey had a number of tools embedded in it to strategize what was driving certain characteristics in our population. So we had the Maslach Burnout Index, which is probably the most validated assessment tool for burnout in health practitioners. We also had that Professional Fulfillment Index, known as the Stanford Professional Fulfillment Index, to see what level or how both the mentee and the mentor groups were viewing their work in terms of fulfillment. We also had an anxiety and screening assessment tool known as the PHQ-4 assessment tool. And in addition to that, we had a number of other questions looking at factors that were driving stress and burnout. So Jenny and myself came up with about 30 different characteristics or 30 different things that we thought potentially could drive burnout, such as administrative tasks or time spent in meetings that we thought potentially could be driving burnout. And we asked participants to report whether any of those factors had been a cause of stress for them in the past six months. And that was what we did to embed within the tools in that initial burnout survey. So that survey was then completed around March 2023. And then we took some time to analyze the results. And that's what's presented in the paper. When people hear these numbers, I think they're going to be a bit shocked. But can you tell us what the main results were? Yeah. So looking at just the burnout Initially, so the Maslow Benno Index reported that 77% of the consultant group and 82% of the mentee group had experienced burnout in the last 12 months. When we looked at professional fulfillment, the rates were very low. So not a single trainee reported a sense of professional fulfillment at the time of the survey being completed, whereas only 5% of the consultant body had reported that. Anxiety and depression rates were also higher than we expected in the trainee group or in the mentee group, sorry with 32% of mentees reporting some screening rate of anxiety and up to 16% reporting some screening rate of depression. This was lower in the mentor group with 7 and 2% respectively. What was more interesting 
from this data was also looking at some of the factors that were driving burnout because that was something that hadn't been previously established. And we could see that one of the key reasons for burnout was high administrative tasks for the mentor group. And well, as well, some surprising findings such as a lack of supervision. A lot, up, up to 40% of trainees reported that lack of supervision was a key cause of them being stressed in the last six months. Yeah, so they're, they're amazing results. And so have you been able to benchmark that with surveys elsewhere in oncology or non-oncology? Is this an issue unique, you think, to medic oncology in Australia during COVID or is there some other explanation? When we looked at the literature in terms of what was published previously, our rates of burnout were actually pretty similar to some other reported healthcare worker rates. So during the COVID pandemic, there were rates reaching about 70% that had been reported in a number of surveys in terms of burnout, but those weren't specifically oncology-based surveys. That was general healthcare workers. A lot of the burnout data comes from nursing and allied health literature bodies, and they have similar rates. In oncology specifically, our rates were a little bit higher. When the American Society of Clinical Oncology did a burnout survey a number of years ago, they found a 45% rate of burnout amongst consultant medical oncologists, whereas ours was upwards of 75%. So we had a higher rate than the American results. However, when the European Society of Medical Oncology or ESMO did a survey, they got a 71% burnout rate when they when they assessed for it. So it has been previously reported to be quite elevated in, in, in other parts of the world as well. What was a bit unique with our research was that we tried to look at factors that were driving the burnout, and that has not been really clearly reported in literature before. And so when we asked those questions in terms of what specifically both mentors and mentees were felt that were driving burnout, that's when we felt like we got a lot more information. Just another example of that, lack of sleep, for example, was reported in upwards of 75% of, of mentees as a key stress factor and that was driving burnout for them. So simple things like that were not known really clearly, at least in the oncology space. Well, these were really high rates. So I was a bit surprised. So Jenny, I might ask you, do we know there was 39% of trainees identified lack of supervision as a key stressor and lack of support from the training college is 58%. But do we have any detail on that? What was the issue about the lack of supervision? Yeah, so we're certainly in the process of getting getting more information. And as part of the follow-up at the end of the mentorship program, we have pleasingly noticed that at the end, after participants went through the one-year virtual program, the rates of burnout had significantly reduced. We're in the process of writing those results up, but also doing some in-depth qualitative interviews with participants, both mentees and mentors. From these discussions, and also, I guess, my own experience being a mentor on the program, some of the issues relate to the fact that increasingly oncology is becoming quite a fragmented in terms of employment a fractionated subspecialty where many of us are working multiple fractions or juggling multiple roles. And that can make supervision sometimes challenging if the supervisor is spread across different sites. For some trainees, it could be perhaps a limited time to be able to meet regularly or have sort of coaching mentor type discussions with their supervisors to discuss outside of the immediate clinical management of patients, their overall goals, their learning objectives and things like that. So having an independent mentor outside the network to debrief on some of those bigger picture things uh, has come across as things that has been helpful. I guess in my role within the MOGA executive, it's also quite apparent that this is not a single issue and it's certainly multi-pronged. Workforce planning is something that MOGA has been actively working on and the results of this paper has triggered the setup of several meetings across the wellbeing and workforce leadership within MOGA to identify uh, the problems relating to the fact that oncology is becoming more complicated. There are good now lots of trial options, uh, treatments through compassionate access. There's a lot more paperwork, though. And so all of the complexity is increasing number of cancer survivors is also adding to workload of our profession. And not surprisingly, there's burnout both in trainees as well as in the mentors. So I think there'll be many ways that we'll need to work together to address this, both at an institutional level, but also at a society and at a MOGA, like a, a national level. So the first step is obviously identifying the problem and you clearly identified that. The mentorship program seems to be 
a very valid solution and understand the results of the evaluation of that is in a subsequent publication. In the meantime, where can people go if they're feeling anxious, depressed, burnout? What do you suggest any of our listeners do? Sure. So there's certainly, hopefully, lots of resources within their individual training network and within their hospital. So debriefing with the director of training within each hospital network, as well as with colleagues and the consultants that these trainees are working with initially would be very valuable as additional sources of support and advice. Uh, MOGA and the National Trainee Rep, we would all be very happy to talk with any trainees in distress. And then broadly, you know, being part of a mentorship program, they're having an independent person outside that network, being able to speak with them would be very helpful. MOGA has just put together a guide for advanced trainees that we've all been circulating as recent as a few hours ago with our heads of department. So that's hopefully going to be additional source of information. Uda, did you have any other suggestions? So in terms of resourcing for support. A lot of the hospitals will have inbuilt counselling and HR departments that have systems in place to help both trainees and consultants that may be struggling with their well-being. Sometimes it's a bit hard to know how to access support, but often the HR departments do have ways of which to access confidential means of identifying people that are under you know, increased workload stress or other forms of stress. And that's probably the additional factor that I would add to Jenny's comment. I do think that Mother itself does provide some well-being resources. But like Jenny was saying, I think the first point of call is definitely to speak with the director of training, um, which often in a lot of departments is separate to the actual head of department to speak about their issues. And especially because now, as we've identified that different individuals will have different stresses that are leading to burnout. It may be an issue of time. It may be an issue of outside work related factors. And there's no harm or shame in expressing those concerns to people that are in positions to make changes for you as an individual to help optimize your workplace situation. Great. So wise advice. And lastly, Jenny, is a mentorship program still ongoing? Yes, that's right. So we've been very pleased to get MOGA's formal endorsement this year and continue the program in 2024. So it's embedded now within the organization and we'll hopefully be having a half day dedicated time for face-to-face -face orientation, hoping to also bring in some professional facilitators to help better train participants on how to get the most out of the program. Adding to the point about support within the profession, I guess the other source of support is family and then having GP. We were pleased to see that in the survey done last year that over half of mentees and mentors did have their own GP and saw their GP in the last six months. And that's certainly something, you know, as doctors, we tend to skimp on that when we're well or we don't have much time. We, we don't really look after our own health, but I think certainly having a GP and being able to touch base with them and look after our own uh, well-being is really important. In our discussions with our colleagues, it's been very interesting to hear that ESMO and ASCO, there are mentorship programs and we've started reaching out with ESMO colleagues to align our baseline survey so that we can cross compare data. The other thing is we did get some interest within hematology, palliative care and radiation oncology. Some of these other organizations also have mentorship programs or are interested in setting this up. So we'd be very happy to discuss this further and share resources. Fantastic. So thank you again. Congratulations to both of you for getting this publication in a very high impact journal, JCO Oncology Practice. Great. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. You guys had a chance to look at the paper. The burnout stuff is just so fascinating. I mean, medical oncology is apparently a predicted specialty compared to others because we've got higher resilience and a higher emotional connectivity, higher emotional intelligence. But at the same time, it remains a really big issue for many and no one's immune. And I think that's important that we acknowledge it uh, amongst our colleagues and even amongst ourselves if we see the warning signs of it, uh, which are there. And lend, uh, you know, extend a hand of uh, friendship and a listening ear uh, to our mates if we think they're struggling. Exactly. So I was really surprised to see the, the level of burnout recorded in their baseline survey. And then we'll see in another paper uh, the results of the program that they've implemented, but it looks like a really interesting mentoring program that benefited not just the, the trainees or the mentees, but also the mentors. 
it's great to see that mentoring program actually being implemented. So often hospitals will implement burnout programs like Dr. Glockham Flecken would point out, please do this burnout resilience training in your spare time and evenings and weekends, which is, you know, the greatest of priorities, isn't it? I think one of the things I thought about that paper on burnout, which I just wanted to add, was that there was an analysis by gender. And we know in other papers that female doctors suffer greater burnout because they have differing home responsibilities and differing multiple care responsibilities. So I'd love to see whether the MOGA team could go back and have a look at whether the same protective effect was seen in the mentors, whether they had the same gendered split, medical oncology being increasingly a feminine specialty, whether that's affecting what's going on. So I I think this work to be done in that space. Yeah, great point. So I'm sure Jenny is a big fan of the podcast. She'll be listening and she can maybe respond. Thanks, Kate. Then what are you going to tell us about today? Look, I love a good summary paper because like everybody, I'm very busy and Cardoso every year, her and her team uh, put out a fantastic summary paper of all of the cool new things in breast cancer. I wanted to draw your attention to what I think is an argument in the breast cancer literature, which is are all CDK4-6 inhibitors the same or is palpocyclib a dud? So those of you that are in this space realize the, the two are other, so Monarch E for abemocyclib and Natalie for ribocyclib, have been touted as positive papers. The palpocyclib um, adjuvant papers have been negative. Similarly, in the metastatic setting, although the doubling of PFS we get C in all three disease types, the palpocyclib was not able to demonstrate an overall survival benefit out of that. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that might be, and no one's been brave enough to do a CDK46 head to head trial. But when even a farmaker is funding a second CDK46 because they think palbocyclib is not as good as ribocyclib, I'm fascinated by what more data is going to come out in that space. So, Kate, just on that exact point there, just noting that, as you mentioned, that Pharmac have just released a consultation to fund ribocyclib uh, in addition to palbocyclib. Do you know anyone who think that ribo is a better drug and that Pharmac are making a good decision, or do you think this is just going to be some funding deal they've come to? I suspect it's a package. My concern is I've not used ribocyclib. This is now going to make our clinics very complicated, having two drugs with different toxicity and side effect profiles available. I understand ribocyclib requires a lot more ECGs, at least initially, like weekly, fortnightly, so that's more resource. The other concern I have is all of those women who are on palbocyclib are now being told they're on an inferior drug, and that, that whether or not that is true, we have inferred data. We don't have any head-to-head data. So I think that's going to be a really tricky thing for us to walk. And will the criteria for access be similar and therefore will the community switch to the perceived better drug? The access, you cannot have had another CDK46 inhibitor, so you can't switch. So you either are on Palbo or you're a new patient and you get to choose between Palbo or Ribo, or you and your doctor get to choose between Palbo and Ribo. I think that is going to be really, really interesting. So I think June 24, I think, is when access comes. The other sad thing, of course, is it's being touted as another option for breast cancer patients. It's not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there was a little bit on immunotherapy and triple negative. Kate, is that available to use as yet in, in New Zealand? Like everything, it's available but not funded. So yeah, there is a large group of women, particularly in the neoadjuvant space, who choose to add pembrocyclib alongside. I think there's some real-world data and real-world concerns about combining platinums and anti-PD-1s in well women. The majority of women are going to be cured without the pembrolizumab, and I think that is something to think about in the future. We need to narrow down our population to whom we are exposing agents who may end up with lifelong toxicities as a result was in this month's Lancet Oncology, which looked at the toxicities of adjuvant or neoadjuvant PD-1 inhibitors and found that with adjuvant, there was an excess rate of death around fourfold compared to neoadjuvant, which didn't appear to increase the risk of death. And when most of the adjuvant studies are, as you mentioned, for marginal benefit and have certainly only shown DFS as their primary endpoint, is of concern that potentially healthy and cured patients are exposed to agents that may cause excess death. Talking still about breast cancer, Chris, was a this paper in other tumours? That was well. a, a meta-analysis in all studies. So across tumour types? Yeah. Or just still in breast cancer? Yeah, across tumour types. Yeah, great. So we'll put a link in people want to look at that. And But Kate's paper from Codoso, really fantastic summary of the advances in breast cancer in 2023, and you can dive into more depth if you're particularly interested in one study or another. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Kate and Chris, what have you got for us this episode? In the JCO uh, this January, there was a fantastic randomised phase two study that filled me with enthusiasm, excitement and terror at the same time. 
And this was a randomized phase two study looking at prophylactic radiotherapy in people with asymptomatic bone metastases. Now, of course, it's standard practice, of course, to give everybody who's got symptomatic bone metastases consideration of radiotherapy. But the role of prophylactic um, radiotherapy to asymptomatic metastases, of course, remains controversial. There's an increasing literature on the treatment with radiotherapy to oligometastatic sites, so visceral sites, for example, lung or whatever, Comet study, for example, looked at that. But what about bony disease in the context of incurable patients? This was a pragmatic randomized phase two, uh, conducted a center with two contributing local centers, so three centers, that looked at people with incurable disease who had multiple metastatic sites, so viscera, nodes, etc., but no more than five bone lesions. And you could be included if you had a bulky bone lesion, more than two centimetres, a bone lesion and an important weight-bearing structure, so hip or shoulder or sacroiliac joints, or involvement of long bone with a third to two-thirds of the cortex. They also included patients with bony metastases in the spine of what they called the junctional spine, which I wasn't aware this was a particular criteria for radiation, but C7-T1 junction, T12-L1 junction, L5-S1 junction, or any posterior element involvement. Patients were randomised one-to-one to receive uh, standard care, su- supportive care, ongoing systemic therapy, or radiotherapy using any technique, which was a variety of doses were used by investigators. They assumed there'd be a 30% reduction in skeletal-related events with a power of 80%, and they powered it at 65 patients. In the end, 71 were included, 35 randomised to radiotherapy and 36 to usual care, uh, 62 bone mets in the radiotherapy and 49 in the usual care arm, so the radiotherapy arm was slightly worse in terms of bony metastases. What they found was the primary endpoint of skeletal-related events at one year was only one lesion out of the 62 in the radiotherapy had a skeletal-related event compared to 14 of 49 lesions in the usual care arm. So that was 29% skeletal-related events in the usual care arm compared to 1.6% in the prophylactic radiotherapy. Uh, These patients mostly had bone, breast, and prostate study, a variety of sites. Interestingly, an exploratory analysis looked at overall survival, which was improved with radiotherapy, from one year to 1.7 years, favouring the radiotherapy. But of course, the study wasn't powered to look at overall survival, and that was purely exploratory. The eye-catching finding here is the overall survival difference, but of course, we have to interpret that with caution, given that it was a secondary endpoint not powered that way. Of course, the arms may be imbalanced. It was a small study, but it is certainly very attractive, and it you know, works with the cytoreduction argument that is going on with the oligometastatic disease as well. And a randomised phase three certainly warranted also in the interventional arm, there was a reduction in hospitalisation, which I think is actually important in patients who have bony metastatic disease to avoid hospitalisation, avoid spinal cord compression, and avoid orthopaedic intervention. The technical points, I suppose, is the proportion of skeletal-related events in the control arm was much lower than their assumptions at 30% rather than their assumed 60 So it may mean that this was an oligo or poor semi-metastatic population, so people only had one or two bony mets rather than a heavier load, and how that would play out in patients with a heavier metastatic load would be of interest. Is it practice changing? Well, it's something we can do tomorrow. Uh, it's something we can fund tomorrow in our existing s- system. And it's something which probably has limited harm. So I think in the right patient, it could be considered while we await the results of the randomized phase three. I expect the radiation oncology community would have a lot to say. And if we've got any radiation oncology listeners, please feel free to text in or leave comments on the website. So Chris, a really interesting paper. Do you think this is ready to be translated into practice? Like if you had a patient who's having palliative systemic treatment had two or three bone mets, would you think about irradiating them now or wait for the three? Yeah, it's, I think there's certainly enough evidence to consider it now as an option for patients. The ones I always worry about are the long bones, right? You know, so the hips, I remember a patient who was discharged from our hospital once, uh, not having had radiotherapy, but for an outpatient appointment, who in the parking lot snapped their femur. It's a very traumatic experience for patient, but also for doctor to a lesser extent, but some certainly one that stuck in my mind for many years. We've always said the two-thirds cortical thickness means that you should consider rotting or irradiating after that. But this is lesser so, and I think that perhaps is something that I will add to my arm interior, particularly in those long bones. What it means for other sites, such as the vertebrae or the SI joint, I must confess I don't really think about the SI joints as much as a site of disease that I should treat to prevent skeletal-related events. I would like to see some more data refining the sites of interest that we should be considering. I would imagine if we adopted this wholesale, though, that it would overwhelm radiation departments in a very short space of time. I worry about radiology departments, too, because, you know, spine, great. We image that as part of our CT chest and pelvis. 
long bones, we're going to have to go what extending our CT fields or bone scans, which, you know, in the absence of symptoms, I would say are not routinely done frequently. Otherwise, we're not going to see these things. Yeah, I'm just getting a uh, message coming up on the chat here from a radiologist, Peter Mack, who's just saying, why does he want to get a PET scan? <laughs> yeah. So Chris, the primary objective was the reducing scleral related events and then secondary objective included overall survival, which they reported on. But I noticed they also collected quality of life, life data and opiate-free survival, but I don't think that's been reported as yet. Is that correct? They looked at the proportion of patients who were opioid-free and there was no difference in the proportion of patients who were opioid-free between the arms which I think is interesting. I think in terms of the extent of opioid use that hadn't been reported that I could see, and in terms of quality of life, well, I presume if you've got seven extra months of uh, life expectancy that your uh, quality is going to be longer, and that if you've got fewer skeletal-related events, uh, your quality is going to be higher. But that's an inference rather than reported data. I can just see they've put it in an appendix. So it said quality of life by the EQ5D5L composite score is not significantly different between the study arms at any time point. So it's in one of the appendixes. So there you go. So Always time to the detail there, Craig. Good stuff. And an interesting paper. So I've got a couple of things to talk about. And one was from ASCO GU, which was in January. It's a next to report on Keynote 564 with longer follow up. This is adjuvant pembrolizumab prolonging survival in high risk clear cell renal cell cancer. So the two-year data was uh, previously published in the New England Journal, of course, based on a disease-free survival difference, of course, but no overall survival difference. So this is some overall survival data with a 57-month, so almost six years follow-up. And there was a 38% reduction of death versus placebo for a year of pembrolizumab in patients with high-risk clear cell renal cell cancer. So this is the first study ever published or ever presented showing a survival advantage for an adjuvant treatment in clear cell. So probably is of significance. It's not been published that I'm aware. It's just been presented at the symposium, but was one of the more interesting papers. And so we're moving into the era of using immunotherapy in urothelial cancer. And for the first time, there is a suggestion there may be a benefit for adjuvant use in the high-risk renal patients. You know, at a 50-month time point, there was clear difference in the survival curves. It's about an absolute benefit of about 7%, so 84% versus 91% overall survival. So absolute terms, there's a difference, but it's it's a bit like the adjuvant situation in breast cancer. You've got to treat a lot of patients to see small differences in survival with long follow-up. But for the individual patient, you know, if you're talking about a 7% difference in being alive at five years compared to not, especially in the younger patients, a lot of them will wear the risk of toxicity for that. But we're talking about immunotherapy, potentially life-changing toxicity. So I'm sure it'll create a lot of debate and it'll be interesting if it is approved for use, it'll be interesting discussion point with patients in the clinic if it does come into availability. The Kiwis are looking blank because they're probably not going to get this drug in a hurry. Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah, so Craig, Chief Onco Cynic and Contrarian Vinay Prasad covered this paper on his plenary session podcast recently, and he filleted the paper particularly for the post-protocol therapy saying that the uh, control arm didn't get access to XE Pembro, which was standard of care, which may have been due to inappropriate control arm suppression. And the issue of appropriate crossover in adjuvant studies is really critical because if you've got an active agent, it's actually an early versus late study, right? And if you decline to treat people late, then that's not a fair comparison. So the issue of crossover is actually relevant. What were your reflections on that commentary? Can I say, I'm not sure that was fair in that at the time that this study was conducted, whether that was the standard of care on progression. You know, this study was conducted, just looking back in the New England paper, which was the two-year follow-up, and that was published in 2021. So this is, people were recruited to this trial perhaps, you know, seven, eight years ago. So I'm not sure that, yeah, it was the interesting comment, but, you know, I think your point, 
about comparators and availability of crossover treatment is absolutely valid and it's something that we need to consider when we're looking at the results of papers like this. But you can only put it in the context of the time it was conducted, I guess. Yeah, 100%, Craig. I think the good thing about this paper is it's reporting overall survival, which for adjuvant studies is clearly the gold standard. And I think let's wait for the publication to have a look at those crossover figures and to get to the detail a wee bit more. I think all adjuvant studies should report OS. I think we should be very careful about adopting any adjuvant therapies without OS, particularly when you've got IO and it's a different mechanism we, and we do have the ability to salvage some patients with that. So congrats to the authors for doing that. Exciting to see an adjuvant paper with OS and the first thing RCC to actually show an OS gain in this context and it will influence practice, no doubt. I think they refer to something like 17,000 patients enrolled into published adjuvant studies in renal cancer. And this is the first study showing benefits. And we've all, you know, I've recruited patients to adjuvant studies over the years. And, you know, kudos and respect and thanks to the patients and families of those patients that enrolled on studies that ultimately turned out to be futile. And it's interesting to always reflect back on that. I think when we get a bit hyped about this one particular study, there's a lot of patients who've undergone treatments unnecessarily to get to this point. All right. So my second quick bait is in a paper, again, immunotherapy. Sorry for the New Zealanders, you can just sign out a little bit again. This is immune-related adverse events and survival. <laughs> was that two fingers or one, Kate, on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> this is immune-related adverse events and survival amongst patients with metastatic lung cancer treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. First author, Dr. Sarah Cook. This is a group from Canada, Alberta, Canada, who did a retrospective analysis of an Alberta immunotherapy database of patients receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors between 2014 and 2021, with a follow-up until March the 31st, 2023. So in the past, there's been small retrospective series, and this is a large series of some 803 patients. They were treated either with nivolumab, pembrolizumab, or atezolizumab. It doesn't appear to be any combo immunotherapy, but there was some patients treated with chemo immunotherapy, single agent immunotherapy. And what that has confirmed is that findings suggested in the past is that there's actually a survival benefit if you have a significant immune-related adverse event from receiving the immune checkpoint inhibitor. So we've kind of known that, and there's no randomized trial, but this is a large retrospective series. So potentially confirming what we know, if patients receive a significant immune-related adverse event from their checkpoint inhibitor in lung cancer, you can safely stop it knowing that there is an activation T cells or whatever mechanism is leading to this improved survival so a couple of other little snippets. So I did a multivariate analysis controlling for other factors like AG, COG, PD1 expression, etc. And the only thing that was ind- independently correlated with this survival advantage was the significant immune-related adverse event. There was no difference if patients needed to be hospitalized or not. So if they were, you know, grade three or four needed hospitalization, they didn't do worse than the patients who were successfully treated as an outpatient with oral steroids. So they still had a survival advantage, even if they needed to come into hospital. And restarting the immunotherapy, if it was kind of a lower grade toxicity and they recovered and you wanted to rechallenge them, that wasn't correlated with any extra survival benefit than if you just stop it. So that's interesting retrospective finding. And the other thing to note is that the time to second treatment was substantially longer if patients received that immune-related adverse event. So they had the event, they stopped treatment, and they went on for substantially more months before they needed to start a second line of therapy. And the overall survival difference between the groups was, I think, clinically meaningful. There was a difference in the overall survival between those who had the event or those who didn't actually extended out from 9.8 months versus 23 months. So it's quite a, you know, you don't see survival differences like that in randomized trials, nine months versus 23 months. So quite a big difference. So I think this confirms that if we do have patients with lung cancer who have a significant adverse event, these were pneumonitis, colitis, or skin toxicity, you can stop it and reassure the patient 
that they still get a survival benefit. So nice little paper. Well, that's hugely reassuring for patients. And I think also fits, I guess, it feels intuitive, doesn't it? If you get an adverse immune event that the immune system's working, therefore it's going to be working on the tumour too. So it's quite good that's played out in the data. And also great that patients can be reassured about that. We also saw that, I suppose, with hand-foot syndrome with capsider being in the adjuvant bowel papers um, many years ago, Christopher Twell's analyses uh, showed a similar thing. And that also was cetuximab and the GFR rash, for example, people who got the rash had a better survival gain. They pursued that with dosing strategies to try to accentuate toxicities without any additional luck, certainly with cetuximab. Craig, is there any thought about, you know, we know that higher doses of IO are associated with higher rates of toxicity of, of dose escalation of those and people who don't get toxicity, or for example, if you don't get it adding in a second agent like CTLA-4? That's a really good question, Chris. I'm not sure, as probably the fair answer. So I'll take that on notice and we might bring that up at the next episode. Chris, have you got a couple of quick bites for us as well? Yeah, I also just wanted to go through some of the comments we got from our last podcast as well. Uh, we had one email from E. Segalova and it said, <laughs> g'day, 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 long time listener, first time emailer. Love the podcast. Got to say it's gone downhill since you changed your <laughs> broadcasters. Bring back Eva. <laughs> Love you too, Eva. That's a fair comment. I can't quite do the g'day, g'day, g'day the same way as Eva. We miss Eva. We're going to get her on and have a chat real soon. But in all seriousness, Chris. It would be great to hear how our, our favourite our Melbourneian professor is getting on in her new role as Dean of the Medical School in Switzerland and Bern University. Obviously, OJC podcast hosts Craig go on to big, bright things. No pressure, man. <laughs> The paper I wanted to cover off today was one that was presented at GI ESCO and hasn't yet been published, which was Checkmate 8HW, which was the use of immune therapy in deficient mismetropia colon cancer. Now, the background to this, of course, is that we know the Checkmate, the Keynote 177 study of first-line chemo versus pembrolizumab in DMMR colon cancer it was very much practice defining for that population. In that study, we saw a median PFS of 8 versus 16 months favoring immune therapy and a 12-month PFS rate of 55 with immune therapy compared to 33 with chemo. And a good response rate was that early crossover of the curves where that initial 40% of people treated with IO actually did slightly worse than those treated with chemo. And so they had to do lots of complicated statistics to show that it benefited. But what we all saw on the curves was that people who got IO, it was a tail on the curve and it flattened. And we've seen that in clinic, people who've got DMMR colon cancer who get IO can go into long-term durable remission. And I've now got patients at five and six years post IO who remain in remission. So it's clearly a breakthrough treatment. The question is, can we do better? And whatever Pembro does, Apinevo tries to do better. And this was the study, which was a randomized three-arm study looking at Nevo versus Apinevo versus Chemo, randomized two to two to one, uh, industry-sponsored study. This first report reported the ipinevo versus chemo arm. We didn't hear the ipinevo versus nevo arm, nor the nevo versus chemo arm. It was any line patients with DMMR colon cancer uh, could be enrolled. So they could be first, second, or third line and against chemotherapy. Chemo was a chemo plus or minus a biologic. Biologic was not mandated in this group, which is interesting because some would argue that bevacizumab has got mild immunomodulatory properties and probably should be given to DMMR patients if you were using a biologic there. The PFS curves, if you've not seen them, get onto Twitter and have a look. You can follow my account at Dr. Kiwi CJ. I've retweeted the heck out of that. And it's a great graph because what you see is the PFS curve hanging at 70% at one year, which we just don't see in chemo studies. And the chemo did pretty poorly with a median PFS of 5.8 months. The hazard ratio was 0.21 with lots of zeros before the one. And of course, there was lots of chat about the study afterwards and lots of enthusiasm about it. I think there's a couple of key points to note about the study, and that is the chemo underperformed. Median PFS of 5.8 months is lower than what we saw in the median PFS of 8 months in the Pembro Keynote 177 study. And a 5.8 month is lower than what you see in the benchmark Tornagan study or the Swalgate 0405 uh, study as well, where you've got your median PFS of around 10 months. The chemo arm's underperforming, so perhaps the hazard ratio is a little exaggerated at 0.21. Nonetheless, um, the 12-month PFS of 71 is very, very impressive. Um, the authors conclude a 79% reduction in the likelihood of death or progression. There was no early crossover in the curves, unlike Keynote 177, and the 12-month PFS was certainly higher. The authors argued it was a new standard of care, and I would certainly argue that this was a very good result, and it would make me very tempted to use a Benevo first line uh, in patients with high disease burden. 
Now, I'm going to pull you up there, Chris, not for advertising your Twitter account, but are you seriously promoting a disease-free survival study on the Oncology Journal podcast? I know. I feel like my common sense oncology roots go to commonsenseoncology.org. Being exposed, certainly after our very popular interview with Professor Chris Booth last week. He's just texting me. He's a bit freaked out, actually. He's a bit angry. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. I think that OS should be the endpoint for all of these things, but PFS is going to be the registration endpoint for it. I struggle with exactly that point, Craig. You know, the thing about the study, which is so impressive is the flatness of the disease control curve. And when you're seeing it that flat at 24 months, you just don't see that in chemo studies. So of course we want to see the publication. Of course we want to see the comparison with Nevo to know how much the IPI actually adds to that. So it is immature, but you don't see flat lines like that. And when you do, and you know these patients are relatively chemorefractory, it's reinforcing the case for IO in this patient population. Yeah, it's a fascinating field. I think it's going to be hard for funders not to fund it. Whether we do need the dual therapy or whether it's single, that's probably now the question. It's clearly better than chemo. And uh, there's another message from Chris Booth. He takes it back. Australia is much better than New Zealand. Perhaps just better critical appraisers. Okay. Chris, can I just, uh, can we go over the schedule again? Because it's the lovely low-dose IPI, isn't it? And it stops. That's right. IPI 1, Nevo 240, Q3W, times four cycles, followed by Nevo 480 every four weeks. Chemo arm was allowed IO at progression, so that will be interesting to know if it's a timing effect or not. And Nevo was at 240 uh, for two weeks times six, followed by 480. And so again, IPI low dose, one mg per kg times four. And IPI one from the melanoma literature is clearly less toxic than IPI three, and it is, you know, it's active. Yeah, but Kate, um, hello, I'm your oncologist, Dr. Underhill. I'm just going to pop this nail in your arm. I'm going to give you lovely low dose IPI. So I think, you know, in all seriousness, we'll wait and see whether the IPI's really needed because these patients seem to be so super responsive. But you're right, it is substantially less toxicity with the one milligram per kilogram versus the three. I would the lovely, though, I think, Chris. I think one of the things in my practice is that I see a lot of BRAF mutant DMMR colon cancer. I see much less sludge than I see BRAF mutant. And BRAF mutated DMMR colon cancer is aggressive. It's often got a high load of peritoneal disease. It's often got a high level of liver burden. And when you see a liver which is chock a block full of liver metastases and BRAF mutant DMMR colon cancer, you look at that and think, single agent IO is not going to be able to touch the sides on there. That's your emotional reaction as a clinician when you look at the disease burden and you think about the mechanistics of it. And it's intuitive to think about intensifying that. We've had text conversations with colleagues about do you use a RAF-directed therapy, so beacon up front for that, still the subject of the breakwater study, of course. And some people attempted to use chemotherapy with IO in the absence of data simply because of the impending liver failure that you want to get on top of that. And that's where the art of medicine kicks in uh, but of course, the science says the data is with single agent IO. It's better than chemotherapy. Now we've got data which shows that combination IO is better than chemotherapy. We don't know if two is better than one. Yeah, my hunch is, Chris, if we want to learn from lung cancer, it probably is going to be the chemo nevo combination in those really super high risk patients. It's going to be the benefit because you get, you know, that early falling off the curve, patients progressing and dying before they've received the epinevo to achieve a response. And if in lung cancer, we buy you know, some time and you don't get the same crossover on the curve. So we'll wait and see for the studies. But that's my hunch is maybe that'll be the way to go. Yeah, look, I agree with that point as well, Craig. That's intuitively feels right too. I think the issue with DMMR colon cancer though is that we know from a number of situations in both neoadjuvant and palliative that DMMR GI cancer just doesn't respond nearly as well. It's true in gastric, it's true in colon, the response rates are lower, the durations of response are lower. So it's not necessarily right that combining chemo, which is relatively ineffective, with IO will be better, but it's certainly an important question that we do need to test, particularly for those with high burden of disease. Great, thank you. Dr. Clark, what have you got for us to finish up today's episode? So this is just to, what's the word, stir up Dr. Jackson a little bit into something that he's very passionate about, which is equity. I thought this is interesting because we're trying to make equitable strides in New Zealand, hashtag sadness. But this is a paper that was presented at ASCO GI. And what it looked at is it looked at the fact that a lot of conversations been had in the literature about whether 
the racial differences, and they did use the word racial, the racial differences in outcome between Asian and Hispanic people who do better than white people being the standard, than African Americans who don't do so well, is attributable to genetics. And although they weren't able to understand or couldn't clearly define after trawling through almost 20,000 patients, I think something ridiculous, four, so almost 50,000 patients, couldn't figure out about 40% of the difference. They could attribute 10% to the different primary tumicide, 10% to the different known molecular characteristics, so MSI, KRAS, BRAF, 40% of the variation was able to be explained by the neighbourhoods and the socioeconomic status of those neighbourhoods. So that speaks to work that we can do without clever science. We just need to provide appropriate evidence-based care to everybody, regardless of how much cash they have in their back pockets. And we, we could get rid of a lot of disparities that we have been attributing to some sort of genetic difference, which is just not there. Well, I agree with that. Kate was again another paper in Lancet Oncology this month, which looked at your geographical location in the UK and your time to diagnosis, and it looked at geolocation as a risk factor for cancer outcome, and it clearly showed that access to care was a key determinant of your outcome. And we know that communities are clustered in ways where access different between communities and ethnicity is a factor in where people live, and services are of relevance to where communities live. There's so much work in there. And also when people talk about epigenetic and genetic reasons for why there might be ethnic differences in cancers, what people often overlook is the fact that the social determinants of health and the risk factors for cancers can in fact be unevenly distributed between ethnic groups and they can drive genetic changes too. So the genetic changes may simply be a reflection of the social determinants of health rather than actually being uh, de novo changes as well. So it's chicken and egg on that one. All right. Fascinating stuff. We could talk in a whole episode about disparity and trying to overcome it but we really run out of time for today so big thank you to both of you for giving up your time been a great discussion thank you rachel our producer who's also here on the call thanks for organizing us and please we welcome any feedback or suggestions for papers never know paper gets selected we might even get you on and it's one of your own to uh, have a chat with you and thanks chris Kia ora. And thanks a lot, Kate. Kia ora, Craig. Bye, everybody. You've been listening to the Oncology Journal Club podcast, proudly produced by the Oncology Network. For regular news and podcast updates, we invite healthcare professionals to join us at oncologynetwork.com.au. Your free registration includes a free subscription to our weekly publication, the Oncology Newsletter. And it's a fantastic way to support the OJC. And don't forget to shout out any feedback or paper recommendations to us via our socials. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Journal Club podcast.